Morning. Good morning, Richard James. How are you? I'm very well, Jamie Anderson. How are you? Good. I'm very well. You're looking very uh, Caravaggio-esque with the <laughs> strong lighting on one side of your face. Have I not? Well, I've had a shave. That's all it is. <laughs> That's it. Caravaggio-esque. <laughs> You're looking more like a Salvador Dali. Thank you. Well, I, do you know what? I, for someone with so little hair, this is very unfair, but I'm having a bad hair day today. <laughs> I woke Talk up us through that. and one, that one side of, you know, my limited uh, hair yeah. is all kind of, I must have slept weirdly and it's all sticking out to one side and it, well, I can't get it to go down. It's, it's hidden by my headphones, thankfully, but uh, Fantastic. isn't well, that the well, ultimate audio, cruelty? You know, to have, uh, yeah, it's not fair. Anyway. <laughs> Poor you. Such is life. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? <laughs> and what, what 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 are you doing today that means we have to record this at uh, this <sighs> ungodly hour? I know. We we are up at the crack of dawn, aren't we? Well, certainly for me. I'm yeah. showered and dressed and everything all by ten past nine. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> I know. It's so impressive. I know. I'm an actor. I generally don't get up till 11. Uh, well, I'm going for a nice walk. That's all it is. It's a beautiful day. Oh, I see. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I've got an important date with my wife, and we're going for a lovely walk and have a spot of lunch in Henley, probably. Oh, very nice. Whereabouts? Do you know? Oh, we'll probably head to Cafe Rouge, you know, the old favourite. Oh, Cafe Rouge there is OK, isn't it? Yeah, they, yeah. They can but be Jamie, a bit rubbish. I've got a voucher. Oh, yeah. Uh, percentage or monetary value? 25%. Nice. Nice. No, sorry, no, not even twenty five percent. It's twenty five pounds. That's right. Twenty five yes, pounds. Twenty five pounds. Yes. Well, that will be twenty five percent if you spend a hundred pounds. But that sounds a bit crazy for two of you at Cafe Rouge. <laughs> it does. Anyway, <laughs> now we know the, the complete details of your walk and lunch date with your wife. Yes. <laughs> Shall we do some podcast recording? I think we ought to. <laughs> Pod thirty eight of the Jerry Anson podcast. Here we go. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. <laughs> well, Richard, this what, is it. What, what pop did you say? Pod 38. 38, great. Which in Roman numerals would be... Oh, go on. What, um, XXXVIII? II. <laughs> yes, it would, wouldn't it? Are we going to do the whole podcast in Latin then? Um, uh, no. <laughs> no. Good, that's a really, uh, I suppose we ought to welcome everybody who's tuned in, hoping to hear some Jerry Anderson-related material over the next... 30, 40, 50 minutes, hour and a quarter, hour and a half, whatever it might be. Who knows? So I suppose we better get on with it, haven't we? Absolutely, yeah. yes. So this is the Jerry Anderson Podcast. We talk about Jerry Anderson stuff. Mm. Uh, that other person you can hear is Richard James. Hello. And that first person you heard is Jamie Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's about it, really, isn't it? We just talk Jerry Anderson stuff for ages. Yeah, um, we do. Uh, we... I have a few uh, messages from uh, listeners. We've had uh, people uh, emailing in on uh, podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. People have been tweeting us throughout the week, so I'll be reading out some tweets as well. Uh, a little later on, we've got everyone's favourite, it says here, segment of the podcast, Fab Facts. <laughs> we've got Jerry Anderson News, 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 News. We've got Chris Dale's Amazing Randomizer. Which is Richard's favourite section. It certainly is. And we've got a very special guest in our interview, haven't we? <laughs> we do. <laughs> I said that like he's going to walk in now and take a seat next to me. He's not, unfortunately. No, it's a pre-recorded interview. Yeah. Uh, but uh, his presence alone is turning this podcast into a fun house. Ah, great! It's Pat Sharp, <laughs> lovely Pat Sharp, who um, who I think I mentioned in the interview. I had an autograph from him uh, through yeah. Dad, and his autograph was so illegible. I thought it said Zobcop. Uh, so. <laughs> Which is not a bad name for a new series, to be honest. Absolutely, yes. That sounds Richard like James is. Oh, I was giving you the credit there, but okay. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so yes, Pat Sharp coming up. A nice sort of uh, nostalgic trip through uh, all of the Anderson stuff in Pat's memory there. Lovely. Um, yes. So we're full Great. of full of the joys of Jerry Andersonness today, aren't we, Richard? <laughs> Well, it's absolutely, it's amazing, isn't it? I suspect, of course, the truth of the matter is that everyone has some sort of Jerry Anderson memory stored away somewhere. If you grew up in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even 90s. Or noughties. Yeah, exactly. Listen, if you grew up in any decade since the 1950s, you're bound to have watched some Jerry Anderson. And you probably, it's a fair bet, I would think, have got some very fond memories of it. Yeah. 
So if you've got any that you'd like to share with us, email them yeah. in, podcast at jerryanson.co.uk, or you yes. can tweet them to us, yes. hashtag at Jerry Anson Podcast, and you can tweet That's them to it. me... I'm Jamie Anderson, or yeah. you, Richard N. James. Go on, I don't know. And I that think bit. that's the first time in 37 <laughs> podcasts prior to this that that's happened. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Yeah. I don't like it, though. No, I don't like it either. You can say no, it next time. Won't do that again. It's not as funny when I say I'm Jamie Anderson, because, you know, when yes, you say it, because you're not. Because you are Jamie Anderson. Yeah, yeah, anyway. I see. Right, that's so, Richard, yeah. without further ado, yeah. I'm reaching for a very special book. Oh, uh, well, that's fantastic. That's so. great. <laughs> yeah. No, looking forward to it. Are you trying that's to brilliant. are you trying to avoid no, the, the unavoidable on. segment that is <laughs> Fab Facts? Ah, oh, here we go. <laughs> well, Jay the Time Being on Twitter will be very impressed at this because uh, <laughs> he tweeted earlier in the week, it's that time of the week again, and he posted a fantastic picture of his own copy of Fab Facts. And I wonder if he plays along at home. Well, it's kind of difficult to play along at home unless you, he starts flicking at the same pace as me. And uh, Anyway, well, no. And as we knows. know, I change where I stop every week. Anyway. You change the rules as you go along. Absolutely. Yes. Anyway, Fab yeah. Facts, for those who don't know, uh, I take a tome of Fab Facts from the Jerry Anderson universe. There's a, a real book. Listen, yeah. you can hear it here. Uh, oh, I flick through the pages. Richard yells Fab, stopping me at one page or another, somewhere in the book, probably, maybe. I may adjust it slightly if it's a picture yes. page. Uh, and then I'll pick out one or maybe two if we're really lucky fab facts of the week, which then Richard, will, Richard and I will be surprised by. Uh, we'll examine further or we'll debunk if we know it's a, uh, a false yeah. fab fact. Yeah. Anyway, Richard, yeah. shall we get on with it? Yes, Here's yes. the tome. Are you ready with your fab? I'm ready. I'm ready with my facts. Here we go. Fab! Oh, now again. here yes. is uh, here is something which uh, there is a picture here. We're not going to go with this one. Well, th well, this is not there is a picture, but it's not a fact. But I'm just going to tell you a little story associated with it. Okay. The picture right here is of a uh, uh, polystyrene recarved Tracy Island. Right. That was 2.44 meters in diameter. Nice. Uh, and it was carved in Shed 11 at Pinewood Studios next to the Bond stage. Mm -hmm. uh, I was there when it was, was being done. Well, and well. I'm pretty sure that Mark Harris, who was uh, art director on um, Terror Hawks and has gone on yeah. to do amazing Bond stuff and um, was J.J. Abrams' right-hand man for the first new Star Wars movie, um, Mark rigged up a hot wire to cut through the polystyrene, you know, Ooh, it, it yes. just literally a wire attached to a car battery, essentially, that got incredibly yeah. hot, so you could slice Health the polystyrene. As a, I guess, six or seven-year-old, that was one of the most exciting things I'd ever seen. And they gave me all the offcuts of this very Tracy Island <laughs> wow. to, to play around with and slice myself. You and had I, the offcuts. Yeah, I can almost smell it. It's so weird to see How that picture. How long did you keep them? Uh, oh, well, well, I went home and tried to make my own hot wire. Of course uh, which, you, did. you know, at seven years old, probably not, not smart, but uh, yeah, what a <laughs> lovely memory. Anyway, I, that's, <laughs> yeah. I have some very happy memories of that period. Anyway, on to the actual... There for, when, for when smell and, uh, you know, memory become interlinked. It's, Syn uh, synesthesia, is it? Mm, yeah, that's right. Something you've got like got that. that going on, haven't you? I absolutely do. Yeah. Uh, now, mm. we're going for um, two fab Great. facts today. From yeah, the 1960s. Uh, right. The first of which is National Petrol sponsored a supercar car club for young viewers in the early 1960s. There you go. Interesting wow. marketing choice for yes. National Petrol to be targeting children. But Gosh, that couldn't happen now, could it? No. Well, maybe, I don't know. Mm, it's a bit of a weird know. one. I mean, I suppose it's to get their parents to go and buy petrol from those stations i don't even know yeah. what natural did you petrol, collect, national petrol collect is. vouchers and, yeah, and things be. and trinkets and yeah and stuff yeah fascinating anyway there yes. you go uh and second fab fact for today television today reported in august 1962 that fiber xl5's co-star venus provided and i quote all the vital interspace glam for the series <laughs> <laughs> please, please tell me there's a character in Firestorm that's going to bring all the into space glam. <laughs> well, that's me, obviously. Uh, of course. Uh, <laughs> of course wow. There you go. That's a great bit of retro, slightly it? sexist reporting. Well, is it though? I mean, he could, they could have said that about a male character as well, couldn't they? I mean, it didn't go on to speak about her, you know, vivacious curves or anything. Well, I mean, that quote doesn't continue, so I don't know. But yeah, well, now. Fair enough. 
if anyone can track down that quote and that yeah. article, <clears throat> yeah. it'll be Ian Jacqueline, who's been tweeting yeah, it quite uh, vociferously recently. Yes. Is that the right yes. adjective to use? Oh, what it'll do. <laughs> Sure, it's the right one, but it'll no, do. No, probably not. Uh, anyway, there you go. Uh, uh, anything more to add to those uh, fab facts, Richard? I mean, they're slightly before our, our time, aren't they? They are, really. But there is a certain character that I like to think in Space Precinct who uh, brought all the interspace glam to the series. Well, obviously. Simone Bendix, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought for a minute you were going to say Orin, and that, I mean, that would have been ridiculous. <laughs> uh, now, Philip Davenport got in touch uh, on Twitter, uh, hashtagging Jerry Anderson Podcast. He said he's just been listening with interest to Pod 37 and the odd objects in Jerry Anderson's scenery and model work. Because we were talking about cigar tubes and. In the last on. set of fab facts, yes, we were. That's right. And uh, he said, so people are listening, Jamie, and enjoying. Uh, he said, <laughs> he didn't say I that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Am I right in recording I once read that there's a lemon squeezer on the wall in Thunderbird 1's launch bay? And there is. There is, and I tweeted him a response yeah. showing the picture. Yes, it's a famous one, and Mike Trim, who I think put it there, yeah. um, now famously absolutely regrets doing it because he never Aww. thought at the time people would spot it, and certainly they, he never thought they'd re-examine it, you know, 50, <laughs> yeah, of course. 54 years later. So yeah, there you go. Right. So if, they, you, if you've got anything uh, fab fact-wise that you want to, you know, come back with, if you found a quote or found something related to one of the facts, then do email us in, podcast yes. at gerryanderson.co.uk. Yeah. But for now, oh, Richard... Yeah. Oh, 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 are we coming to the end, right? All you, together now... Fab, fab facts! facts. Slightly mistimed, Jamie. Well, that's the view to the edit, Richard. I can, uh, <laughs> I can make it sound perfect. In fact, our also, listeners will be none the wiser. <laughs> right, great. Uh, also, I suppose people could get in touch with, with us, couldn't they? At podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk, or they could tweet us on Twitter at hashtag jerryandersonpodcast if they had their own fab fact they wanted to share with us. Absolutely, because this tome of fab facts is finite, so we, yeah. we could probably do with adding some more. So yes, that's do, right. do email in. Right, Richard. Also, I, that's the second time I've heard the word tome in the last minute or two, and I've not heard it before in the previous three weeks. Oh, well, sorry for saying tome too many times. Oh, there it is again. Tome oh. many times. Yes. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, that's, that's the end of our facts for now. You get a rest until next week. Very good. Any tweets you want to read out in the meantime, or should we just oh. go on to the other good bit of the... No, uh, no, 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 people are part. always getting in touch. The incompetent pilot, for example, is one of my favourites, Get in, gets in touch uh, very often. The only good thing about the start of the week is being able to listen to the Jerry Anderson podcast to and from work, SIG. And earlier in the week, uh, he tweeted, the best Monday signed Space Precinct book arrived, and the new podcast is up, the perfect Monday. Uh, he said he loves the picture on page 131 of Space Precinct Unmasked, which he's dubbed Tuna Sandwich. And if you've read the book, you'll know what that's all about. If you haven't, then you should get yourself a copy from the Jerry Anderson store. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Where signed copies are in stock right now. They are indeed, yes. Uh, also, I should just say, uh, it's great, a wonderful thing, if you can uh, just uh, subscribe to this podcast, wherever you happen to be listening to it, uh, because it means you get uh, notifications every week, every time a new episode appears. And while you're there, why not leave us a review and uh, a nice rating and uh, also share with your friends so they get to join in too. Yes, we would dearly love it if you would do those things. Yeah. And if you happen to have found this on YouTube and think, oh, I want to listen to my podcast player, well, you can do that. Just go onto any podcast player and search Jerry Anderson Podcast. Yeah. And likewise, if you're thinking, oh, I like listening to this, but I wish there was some visual stuff uh, relating to the world of Jerry Anderson, well, then you can yeah. go to the Jerry Anderson YouTube channel, cool. youtube.com slash Jerry Anderson TV, and subscribe there. Lovely. There's all sorts of goodies there, aren't there, Richard? Including, yeah, absolutely. Including us on Fab Live, <laughs> yes. which returns a week today from the release uh, of this true. podcast. The release yes. being Monday the 4th and the Fab Live uh, number 22 yeah, release date being the 11th. This. Anyway. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, March 11th, we'll be there, 7pm, YouTube, Twitch, um, various other platforms, and Facebook Live, of course, Yes, uh, with, with the next Fab Live. Yeah, we'll be, be everywhere. Uh, and that sort of preempted the next bit, Really, because that's sort of Ooh. a bit of news, isn't it? It is a bit. So then what should we do? Bit of news, 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 news? Yeah, fine. Jerry Anderson News now. Come on, then. Right, newsy news, news, news this week. Yeah, bring it on. I'm starting with a bit of news from last week, but listeners may have missed it. 
Oh. So Marcus Hearn, on our interview yeah. last week, which is part two uh, of his interview, which started in pod 35, but we skipped over for pod 36 for our uh, tribute episode to Richard Gregory. Mm-hmm. Um, Marcus announced at the end of his interview with me that there is a brand new Space 1999 book on the way. Space 1999. Brilliant. The Vault. Yeah, that's great. Uh, now, lots of you may already have seen Thunderbirds, The Vault, and Captain Skull at The Vault from previous years. It's a collection of great photographs, um, stories, anecdotes, historical bits of note, information about transmissions, all sorts of stuff, um, interviews, and lots of photos of, of merchandise and props from across the years. Really lovely stuff. Uh, and it'll be out in September, hopefully in time for Breakaway Day, which obviously, Richard, is which day of September? The something. The, the what do you say? The <laughs> The thirteenth, thirteenth, the thirteenth, the thirteenth of September, nineteen ninety-nine. That very famous date, which you know was in the opening of every episode of Space nineteen ninety-nine. No, that's great. I I should be signing up for that one. Uh, uh, Absolutely, getting that book. And uh, also, uh, Space nineteen ninety-nine returns to, uh, or rather, starts transmitting on um, Forces TV on the March the fifth. I think. Uh, Do you believe so? This very week, if you're listening to the podcast in the week of release. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so just search Forces TV online and you'll find where to, to watch them. But they're on Freeview and FreeSat and Sky and Virgin and all those uh, services in the UK. Yeah. And if you're outside of the UK, if you're in the US, I think, I'm pretty sure that Comet is screening Space 1999 Ooh. right now as well. Great. Um, and beyond that, there's all the shows on Amazon and iTunes and all over the place. Yeah. Uh, so there's always a way to find some Jerry Anson stuff. So a big uh, a big year for Space 1999. Might we see some extra goodies coming our way as the year progresses? Merchandise yes, th- and stuff? Yes, there will and... probably be some stuff. There's yeah. definitely some stuff that I know about that hasn't been announced yet. Lovely. So um, uh, I can't see any more than that, but there will probably be some, some things coming up. So stay Great. tuned to the podcast yes. or go and sign up uh, to the Jerry Anson newsletter mm. at, the, at jerryanson.co.uk and mm. you'll then receive bits of news and goodies like this in your inbox. Lovely. Speaking of the website, Richard. Oh, yeah. Chris Dale has been churning out some nice new articles oh, about not Space 1999 yeah. Yeah, and Thunderbirds. Cool. Um, and those articles have been incredibly popular. They've been sh- shared wildly across yeah. social media, bringing... Thousands and thousands and thousands of new people to the website, which has been rather exciting. Great. So thanks for doing those, Chris. You can pop along and read them if you like. Uh, or like I said, if you sign up the Jerry, and- Jerry Anderson newsletter, you'll get uh, those articles sent direct to your inbox once a week. Yes, lovely. And finally, for the news section this week from me, unless you've got anything, Richard, that you're going to jump in at the end with. I'm afraid I don't this week, Jim. You don't? Oh, no. That's fine. That's I fine. can make something so up. Yeah, okay, fine. Well, you've got this. the, the time when okay. I make up. Uh, well, I read this to make something up. Right. Um, we've got a fab new range of Thunderbirds goodies arriving in the Jerry Anderson store. Uh, oh, in fact, a few days ago before the release of this podcast, ah. but in the future from when we're recording it. Um, so right now, if you go to shop.jerryanderson.co.uk, you're going to find some rather lovely mugs, Thunderbird 1, Thunderbird 2 and Brains. Yeah. A Lady Penelope teacup, which I think is rather cute. Uh, and a Lady Penelope tumbler, and uh, a Lady P keyring and book. Now the book is basically Lady P's guide to you know etiquette in life in general. Oh, uh, and it is actually quite sweet, uh, including things like you, you know that uh, famous bit from Trapped in the Sky at the end where they're chasing down the hood. Oh yeah, and Lady Penelope says to Parker, um, uh, "Wait for a clear stretch of road." before they, you know, shoot the hood off the road and cause an explosion. Yes. So her, her advice relating to that is, try to be considerate when chasing down one's enemies. Oh, lovely. Uh, so it's quite a cute, fun <laughs> little book. Uh, uh, probably make a great gift. So yes, go and have a look at those. There'll be a, a, a link to the collection on the front page or just search uh, Mug or Lady Penelope and you'll find some lovely goodies there. Gorgeous. So, Richard, what's the fake news for this week? Well, uh, you haven't mentioned, of course, the fantastic podcast live tour that we're embarking upon over the summer, uh, going to all the uh, seaside towns around the country. Every venue will feature a special guest from one of the uh, Jerry Anderson series. We've got Shane Rimmer booked, and we've got Wayne Forrester joining us in Frinton-on-Sea. Tickets will be be available at um, uh, fakenews.co.uk forward slash Jerry Anderson from the end of March. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's a thought, isn't it? It is a great thought. I'd love to do a podcast live. I, I mean, you know, we could we could do all the biggies, like you say, Brighton, yeah, and, um, yeah, Billingham, uh, uh, Thorpes, uh, Bognor Regis, yeah, Skeggy. Uh, oh yeah, a bit of Skeggy, oh. lovely. Uh, oh, and where's that place? To uh, Scarborough. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll do Scarborough. 
Yeah, and Sci Fi by the Sea. Where was that held? That was in Clanded, no? Yeah, but do that again. Yeah. No, no, Sci Fi by the Sea. That was Oh, um, Herm Bay, yes. Yes, Herm Bay, where you where you had um Steady. apple pie with custard and ice. Yes, cream. oh god, that was years ago and I <laughs> I upset Peter Purvis. Yes, well we both upset <laughs> Peter Purvis, didn't we? Sort of. Anyway. Uh, and that, including the real news and that bit of interesting, weird fake news from Richard, is the end of the Jerry Anderson news. That was fake news. That was fake news. <laughs> That's extremely creative of you, of you Richard. Nice work. Uh, now. Yes. You sound like something important's about to happen. Well, it is important because every week we receive many mm. emails mm. from our dear listeners. Cool, don't we? Uh, so if you've sent us an email, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. If you haven't, why not? Send it into podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. If you want to send a voice clip, do so, but do try and keep it under a minute for us yep. or around a minute. Just to do it as a voice memo on your phone and uh, email it in. But I've chosen two interesting emails from this week, Richard, from oh, this okay. week's post bag. Great. And I'm giving you the first one. Oh, yes, so you are. Oh, yeah. So Becca's got in touch. That's nice. At uh, podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. Dear Jamie and Richard, brackets, I hope this is the correct billing order. When will people It is, learn? Becca. It no. is. It is. You're absolutely right, Becca. Uh, Becca. I've tweeted yourselves a few times. Indeed, you have. Uh, but thought I'd drop you an email to say thank you for such a wonderful podcast. I discovered your show late last year and I've nearly caught up with only a few pods to go. Well, bully for you. Uh, you both have an easy and accessible rapport and the behind the scenes interviews are fascinating. I was introduced to the worlds of Jerry Anderson growing up in the 90s by my dad, who grew up with them all the first time round. Uh, Hashtag fab parenting. Absolutely. I have fond memories of watching the Tea Time anniversary reruns of shows like Thunderbirds, Captain Scarlet and Stingray with my family. Your podcast has helped rekindle an interest in all things Anderson. Well, that's job done, isn't it? Uh, and also the upcoming Firestorm, which looks amazing. Yes, doesn't it? That's Firestorm, brand new that's Jerry Anderson good. stuff. Is happening right now. Uh, she goes on to say, I saw the recent post on the Anderson page about how the various title sequences for the shows were adapted for overseas markets. I'm also a fan of anime and was aware of the differences between Japanese, English and other foreign opening titles. I'd like to flip things around and ask yourselves, which is your favourite international opening for a Jerry Anderson show? Do you prefer, prefer our version and why? Sorry for the long email, chaps. Not sure if it'll get read out. Nah, I'm not sure it will, to be honest. I'll go on. <laughs> but just wanted to say hi. Keep up the good work. Becca. Well. Well, thanks, Becca. Yes. That's over to you, now, really, Jamie. I, I don't know much about the international... I was going to say, Richard, sequences. despite your honorary doctorate <laughs> in Jerry Anderson international opening title sequences, right. I, I'm happy to take the lead on this one. Yeah. Um, so, well, they're often adapted, uh, particularly for the Japanese market, where most of the Super Mario Nation opening title sequences had um, songs written. Uh, in the case of Thunderbirds, the lyrics were done to uh, the Thunderbirds march. Right. Five, so, um, four, three, so yes, they, the Japanese version, they wrote lyrics to the Thunderbirds one. march. Wow. Um, which sort of go, well, I will play you a segment. Oh, yeah. Uh, but just so you know the translation roughly, Thunderbirds, fly into the bright blue sky with the wind swelling behind you. Mm, OK, it's something to desire. Quite nice. Mm. And then another cry of Thunderbirds. Yeah. Which you might hear is Sunda Bardo, which I think is the kind of... Yeah. On land and in the sea, for happiness in the world. That's right. There you go. So... Quite unusual, but it seemed to be a thing at the time when they they just wanted to to make it more appealing to the the local audience, and that completely makes sense. Now, Terror Hawks, the yeah. opening sequence of Terror Hawks, yeah. there's a guy talking over the whole thing, trying to give the introduction because they didn't change the visuals uh, of of the opening sequence of Terror Hawks, which has got some elements of the story being told in English. So instead, they read over the top. And there's a really, really, really nice bit. I say really, really, really nice bit for a reason. Yeah. Because they go to Captain Mary Falconer. And the translation is roughly, Captain Mary Falconer, she is very, 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 very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> they really wanted to make sure we knew that she was yeah, beautiful. Just hammer that point home. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So they're, they're very, very sweet. Um, but I think... Uh, my my favourite adjusted version is actually the Stingray opening titles. Oh yes. Which is a 
complete change. The original music is not there. Right. Uh, and it's a, like a little boy singing it, and then a big manly chorus of Stingray, Stingray. Okay, um, wow. So there you go. I'll have to find uh, that. Uh, well, I, I'll put a little yeah. dip into the Stingray one now. Lovely. Here it is. <laughs> Yeah, it reminds me that actually back in the day, uh, we did make up lyrics to the Space Boys. Some of it were clean. Uh, can, you, yeah. can you sing it now, Richard? Well, yeah, no, there's one that's sort of something like, um, uh, oh God, what was it? Um, um, we all work in a space precinct. We all live and work in space. No one knows why it's space precinct when we hardly ever do anything in space. <laughs> Which I thought was quite apt. <laughs> Totally fair. You know what should it have been called then? Well, it's something about Demeter City. I don't know. I don't know. It never. Yeah. I mean, it, eventually we did sort of get off world a bit, and but I think you know it wasn't. It wasn't really space based, was it? It was. No. Other, it was other another planet. Alien planet that, precinct. That's right. Yeah. It doesn't. I mean, space precinct as a, as a name. I don't know. Doesn't really roll off the tongue, does it? I think they were very tied to space police, yes. weren't they? And they and couldn't. because of the Lego copyright issue, they couldn't do it. But they wanted yeah. to keep space because it sounds it's yeah. a natural sci-fi thing. Whereas Demeter City, yeah, I suppose it doesn't have the same. Yeah, and, 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 interesting though, isn't it? Yeah, How you know, because space cops and stuck. star cops and all that. You know, that's all been taken and done. And uh, yeah, what would you have called it, listeners? If you were starting yes. off now, what would you call Space Precinct? Let's give it a better title. Um, the Adventures of Officer Orin. No. I bet you somebody was going to suggest that. That I like. Yeah. Too late. I've done it now. <laughs> uh, anyway, Becca, thank you. Uh, and you see, you sent us off on a weird tangential thing yeah, into you Richard did. Uh, singing lyrics to Space Precinct. <laughs> we weren't expecting that. Uh, Richard, I have an email. Yes. From uh, an anonymous uh, listener. Oh right. So uh, here we go. Anonymous listener writes. Yeah. Fab shows. Mm-hmm. Love the format. Uh, but I've only got to pod number 36 on the 26th of February, so I'm a bit behind. Oh, not that much behind, that's all right. Uh, they tried to get to my webpage, but found the link is not valid. <gasps> I don't know why that is, but my webpage, mm. I mean, I, I've got a website which I've not touched for 18 months. Mm. Um, can't okay. be that, but, right. you know. Yep. I, jerryanderson.co.uk is our main one, and yeah. shop.jerryanderson.co.uk for the other one. Yeah. Don't put www before it, you don't need it. No, <laughs> good point. But people do. Uh, he's got, uh, I say he, this person yeah. has got some merch suggestions. Uh huh. A Captain Scarlet hoodie with lights on the shoulders for night biking. Oh, yes. That is niche, 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 niche. Isn't it? Bikey bike, um, bike, bike. Might get in the way. Yeah. Uh, this listener also wants some Firestorm goodies. Well, I'm afraid we can't do that yet. Only yeah. our original Kickstarter backers can get those. Yes. Um, but uh, there you go. It just, it won't be long. It won't be long. We've got some stuff uh, in the pipeline. Mm. Um, but this listener has also sent us a quiz, Richard. Oh, great. We love a quiz. What connects the following? Right. Sherlock, Marie Antoinette. Right. MI5 and MI6. Jurassic Park. Gosh. Lucille Ball and Jennifer Hart. Right. Only one man connects them all. Can you guess who? I think I might have an idea. Really? I actually think I might have an idea. I've got no clue, so who do you think <clears> it is? <throat> well, let's see if we can join the dots. So there was a... talking. With, it starts with Sherlock. There was a, a movie called Young Sherlock, I think, back in the 80s. Right. Nicholas Rowe and Alan Cox as um, Sherlock Holmes and uh, Watson. Directed by Steven Spielberg. OK. Jurassic Park is also on that list. Directed by Steven, Steven Spielberg. Spielberg. Uh, MI5, MI6... Hmm. This is where it all starts to fall down a bit. Marie Antoinette? Don't know. Has he directed anything about the French Revolution? <laughs> <laughs> I've no idea. Jennifer Hart. Who is Jennifer Hart? An actress. What? Young? Recent? Um, I'm, I'm just and doing Lucille a Ball research. from back in the day. Only one man connects all of the above. Hmm. That's interesting. Well, my best guess has got well, to be Steven Spielberg. You. Th- you think it might be Spielberg. Yeah. I'm stumped. Yeah. Well, uh, unfortunately, the answer is not given in this email. We're going no. to get it next week. <laughs> oh, so, you tease. So, anonymous listener, 
please do send in the answer yeah. so that Richard and I don't have to suffer too much longer. Yeah. Um, but he, anyway, it says, sorry for my typing and a few spelling mistakes. I've just returned from a seven-day rescue job. Oh. Yes, thanks to your father, I joined up uh, to one of the search and rescue units 40 years ago and still doing it now. Wow. That's, that's great, isn't it? Yeah, that's cool. Well, thank Fantastic. you, anonymous listener. That's brilliant. Thanks yeah. for your message. One and of... also for your fiendish little quiz. Yeah, yeah do let us know the answer. It, it um, is fiendish. Now, Jamie, I, I don't know if you know this, but other podcasts are available. Yeah. Really? True. Now, I can't vouch for this, so I haven't had time to listen to it. So, uh, But I just spotted, before we uh, started recording this, um, the Por- Poria Podcast Alliance are on Twitter. Anyway... Uh, go to couchpilotspodcast.com because this week the captains, it says, take a serious look at the UK failed pilot Space Police by Jerry Anderson. Now, well, how do you define failed I pilot? Know. Because it went to series, I so, so that's an interesting definition. Exactly. So this rather begs the question: How much do they know? Well, let us know. Have a listen. Uh, find it on Twitter and have a look at listen to the, uh, the, the their Space Police podcast and uh, see if they know their stuff. Okay. My eye, I'm looking. All. I'm looking forward to listening into that yeah. one. Yeah. There we go. So Great. thank you, listeners, for your emails and everyone for your tweets and stuff. If you've got a question, send it in. Podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. That's right. That's the only way we'll get to it. Uh, or you, of course, can send us some lovely uh, voice messages as well. We'd love to play those out. So do send us a, uh, an audio file, and we can play that in the next podcast. How lovely! Perfect. Yeah. Uh, what happens now, Richard? Well, I think it's time we open the door and let in Pat Sharp. He's probably cold by now waiting out there, isn't he? <laughs> he is. Come on, Pat. Come and come make yourself warm by the fire. So uh, I had a nice chat with Pat, uh, but of course, I think, as I mentioned, we forgot the one main time that he met and interviewed Dad, which <laughs> yeah. was on a Saturday or Sunday morning kids show in the 90s called What's Up, Doc? Mm-hmm. If you remember that. Vaguely. <clears throat> so we completely forgot that. But in a way, it's quite nice because it forced Pat to, to remember other things uh, and took us down an interesting route. So... Um, there you go. Here's some rambling with me and Pat Sharp. I'm Pat Sharp, and it sounds a bit like that guy in The Simpsons now, and you might know me from shows like. And then I say Funhouse and Capital Radio and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So hopefully, probably the the Funhouse show will be the one most reminiscent to uh, to a certain age group. And uh, here we are, rerunning the fun and looking back at all the great Jerry Anderson shows. Thanks very much, Pat. And thanks for doing this. I, I really appreciate it. I, I, I think, and you may not remember, and there's there's no reason why you should, that you you must have met Dad at one point very briefly, in the in the past. Absolutely, uh, um, I seem to remember meeting your dad at one of his, I suppose, the equivalent of what people do now when they go out on the road, but they don't necessarily sing or dance or DJ. They sit <laughs> with a bunch. They sit with a bunch of the equivalent of slides, and I think he had like a slideshow, which literally showed pictures, and he had he did a talk, and it was in kind of smallish theatres, but not that small, but not arenas, and it was quite yeah. personable, and people were able to uh, ask questions and stuff. And I think I sat there and uh, more than one occasion uh, and saw uh, one of those talks that he did, and uh, yeah, I do remember meeting him. Absolutely, it was it was pretty exciting because. To me, he was, um, in a way, a bit like a lot of people now say I am when they meet me, because I did kids telly, and they go, oh, my God, you made my childhood. People say those words to me on regular occasions when yeah. I my DJ sets. And for someone to say you made my childhood is, is quite an accolade. And I would say, in a way, that your dad probably, definitely, to be honest, made mine. So there you go. Oh, bless you for saying that's brilliant. Well, it, I remember that because I wasn't there, but he took with him my little blue autograph book and got you to sign a page for me, uh, which I was thrilled about when he came home. So thanks for doing that. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. Of course, technically, that would be null and void these days because no one asks for autographs. It's all about selfies. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he didn't do a selfie, sadly. Uh, yeah, but I've, I've still got it somewhere. You've got a very distinctive signature, which, uh, yeah, I yeah, remember you vividly. You mean you can't read it? It looks like a doctor. Well, I always thought, because uh, when I looked through, because I hadn't got it in person, I thought it said um, Zobcop is what I always remember reading it as, as a child. Isn't that weird? Anyway, we're not, <laughs> we're not talking about autographs, but I'm, really, I'm glad that you met him and I'm glad you remember. That was on the Jerry Anderson lecture tour. There you go. Um, which, yeah, was very, very popular. Anyway, so Pat, take, take me back in your uh, Funhouse time machine 
to your earliest memories of a Jerry Anderson show, do you, or, or at least su- some of your earliest memories? I think my earliest memories would have to be Thunderbirds. For me, that was the be all and end all as a kid. And when it, <laughs> I remember, even when I was, I think about. 18 maybe i think they started to rerun it on a saturday morning on itv and i couldn't believe it i mean this was this was just too exciting because now i was in a situation where i could record it as well and then watch it back because i had a vhs <laughs> and i would have it forever rather than just seeing it once and having to try and remember it in my head so no that for me was you know even at 18 i was excited by thunderbirds but certainly as a youngster i suppose i was when did Thunderbird start? It must be mid sixties, I think. 65. Sixty-five. Yeah. There you go. So I was four. I was born in sixty-one. So I expect I saw it as a four or five-year-old and and watched it and and loved it. And of course, it would have been in. It was never in black and white. It was always in colour, wasn't it? Uh, so I guess in the UK, actually, it probably would have been broadcast in in black and white to start with. Would it? Okay. Um, I I can't remember when the first uh uk color transmissions were but they don't think they were to the end of the 60s i think from memory yeah, certainly a lot, a lot of people remember them as black and white uh mm, i can remember being excited by saying to my friends we got a color tv <laughs> uh, and i remember being, it's the, it was the same kind of excitement as telling people that we got a, a phone that didn't have the ring dial that you had to turn around you had to push buttons and you could push the button <laughs> And I used to just phone random buttons just to push the numbers and see if it connected to anybody. I'm not sure <laughs> what, my, what my parents thought of the phone bill, but it was <laughs> cheaper to watch Thunderbirds in, um, in uh, you know, in, in, in black and white. But yeah, I just saw it and was I was amazed by it because to me, as a, as a kid, and indeed throughout my life, instead of trying to pick flaws in it and look for the strings on the puppets, yeah. to me, it just looked so real there was nothing in it that made me think that this isn't genuine and this isn't what's what the future is going to be like yeah so you did you didn't watch it at, at the time i mean it's difficult to reflect on it now with a kind of adult conscious appreciation of it but i did you, the puppets didn't become a, a a block to you or they didn't make you think dif- think of it differently to other stuff that was on telly at the time no not at all I, uh, as far as i can remember it was the single most exciting thing much more exciting than seeing something with real people in it <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely agree. Uh, toys? Were you lucky enough to have any of the dinky toys or anything at the time? Yes, I'm sure I did. I mean, the, most of the toys that I can remember, to be honest with you, relating to your dad's shows or programmes, mm. were the Captain Scarlet ones, more than the ah. Thunderbird ones. I guess I did have a Thunderbird 1, a Thunderbird 3, and um, I don't know if I had a Tracy Island or not, but I definitely had an SPV. Uh, there you go. Oh my God, there it is. Look, that's amazing. Yeah. That is, that's, that's one of the original dinkies. So. Oh, wow. And you push that door and it opens, don't you? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, oh, no, uh, me, that door. the, the, that the side door does work. Yeah, there you are. That's it. That's the one. Scarlet's, Scarlet's fallen out of mine. Um, it's amazing. And you know what? Uh, can I see that again? Because yeah. um, I know this won't work for you on a podcast because you're not looking at it, but. Um, we can describe it carefully, can't we? Yeah, I mean, this to me is is the equivalent, if you look at the actual shape of the vehicle, yeah. of the big BMW Jeep, like the X6, I think it is, or something. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. When I see them on the road, they remind me of an SPV. <laughs> I mean, it was, way ahead of its time, engineering-wise, and even though it's a model. Yeah, it was a very, very cool shape. And, I mean, the you know, the, the guys that Dad worked with, like uh, Derek Meddings and Mike Trim, who, who came up with these fantastic vehicles were just fascinated by engineering and an aircraft design and all that kind of fed in so yeah so uh, yes for sorry podcast this is i'm holding up a dinky 104 spv um which is really weighty and substantial uh, and it does it, sadly the missile hatch at the front doesn't open anymore i remember the missile hatch yeah it was one of those toys where you'd quite often end up losing the missile uh it was, it was red wasn't it uh yeah it's got a red tip and i kind of want to open it now see if it'll Oh god, it's 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 yeah, it's pretty jammed shut. But you know, it was white with a red tip, I think, from memory. Yeah, amazing. So I definitely had an SPV. It's yeah. amazing that you picked that up literally as I said it, which is amazing. Um, and I would have had uh, what else did I have from, from from Captain Scarlet? Well, I've got two more I can show you to jog your memory, Pat. Okay. So hang on. I was looking, I was looking around the room to see. Does what that you- ring a bell? Wow, yeah, now that's another, um, 
And the, it wasn't the one that Captain Black drove, was it? No, this is the the uh, Spectrum Saloon car or Spectrum pr- Patrol car, as as Dinky called it, uh, Dinky One Hundred and Three, uh, which is quite cool. There was a weird blue variant as well, which they put out for a while, but uh, they're pretty How rare. Much are these things worth in mint condition with a box? Oh, I think they're worth hundreds if they're in mint in a box, which is amazing. Um, in fact, this one, this one's a very special one to me because Dad, it, Dad signed the bottom of it for me, so it's quite a. What's that? Oh, that's speaking of illegible signatures, Pat. <laughs> uh, Harsh but fair. <laughs> absolutely, and you may, uh, may. Do you remember this one as well? The MSV, the maximum security yeah. vehicle. Yeah, now that looks very similar to like a sort of almost like a, a current Merc or something. yeah. Got like sleek in the doors. They've got gold wing doors. Coming. Those doors are now are what Teslas have. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that really is the future, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. I mean, there's a huge, there's a huge amount of design and technology and stuff that uh, has kind of has come to pass, or those designs and those shows have influenced people so that they end up, you know, working in technology and design, that kind of thing. So it's pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. So, so Scar- Scarlet View, you, you had more toys. Does that mean it was a show that you were more engaged with, or was it just a, that age? I mean, how did Scarlet for you compare to Thunderbirds? For me, it was I, I really I preferred the Captain Scarlet theme tune. <laughs> um, it is it, cool. It had lyrics as well. Yeah, um, and I quite like the tune because I've always, um, you know, having had, had what I've done in radio, been into um, jingles and stuff. For me, it was like you know, it was like a jingle as such. Yeah. And I think I quite liked the, I was a bit scared, I think, by the footsteps and then the gunshot and the cat screaming. Or was it? A cat <laughs> it was a cat, yes. <laughs> so I think I was really into, <laughs> and then the, the sound of Captain Scarlet falling to the floor and, yeah. and then coming alive again was like beyond belief. Like, wow, you know, if you could do that, then I can do anything. I am basically indestructible. <laughs> and, um, and I suppose, in a way, the dum 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 has, has lived on through Anton Deck doing that, haven't they? With moving their heads from side to side. Yeah, it's it is amazing how bits like that kind of pervade popular culture even now, even though it's now a fifty-two-year-old show. Yeah, it's yeah, pretty scary to be honest. So the, you know, there was a there was a, a variant of the introduction where Colonel White said, "Captain Scarlet is indestructible. You are not. Do not try to imitate him." Really? Yeah, because I think they were thinking of using that because they were worried that kids like you yeah. might suddenly decide they're indestructible. Well, I'm still thinking that. So <laughs> clearly, having got this far, I am. Yes, and yeah, with indestructible hair, frustrating <laughs> for me as well. Uh, the Colonel's advice. <laughs> so you you started off with two Jerry Anderson puppet shows, which are actually quite strongly con- contrasting because you've got the. The, the difference in proportions, the large heads and the caricatured features of Thunderbirds through to the human proportions in Captain Scarlet, but also the kind of bright, shiny world where most people end up being saved. You don't really ever see any death in Thunderbirds. It's generally a happy ending, even if, you know, sometimes things happen in the background when you think, what happened to all those people in that car park that blew up? But Scarlet was much darker. It was, you know, dead puppets, blood, puppets drowning in streams, uh, bank robbers being blown up. I mean, did, did either of those kind of, did, well, did the darker side bring you in more, do you think, than Thunderbirds? And how do you feel like that about that as an adult? It could have done, but then to be honest with you, I distinctly remember what happened in uh, many Thunderbirds episodes, whereas I don't really remember what happened in Captain Scarlet. Ah. I don't think I could tell you a single Captain Scarlet episode with a storyline, but I could tell you, you know, everybody remembers the alligators and the... Yeah building and everything they remember thunderbird stories i think they're yeah slightly different because i think generally what i remember about captain scarlet was that he was just permanently you know chasing the captain back and the mistrons because they were trying to mess everything up um it was the same recurring theme wasn't it for that well very much so yeah it was the mistron delivering some sort of threat and then carrying it out essentially there was yeah, they were like blow felt at their time and uh, yes and in a way i suppose you say if it was darker you know thunderbirds was like uh, i suppose uh, midsummer murders or something you know to liken it to that and uh, captain scarlet was more like luther <laughs> <laughs> Never heard anybody draw those parallels before, but I, I'm completely with you. Yeah, yeah it's a lighter, more more sort of generalist appeal, but we're still yeah. with the kind of a little light sense of adventure yeah. uh, compared to Scarlet. Um, did did you move on to 
uh, Joe Ninety, dare I ask? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I remember Joe Ninety, and I liked it. I thought I thought it was very cool the way he went into. I, I loved the uh, the sort of. I suppose it was a Terry's chocolate orange that you said. <laughs> the big rat, uh, technically they called it, yes. But it is very much like a Terry's chocolate orange, absolutely. And he looked like his dad, which was quite good. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, I never, I couldn't remember a Joe Nighty story. I was a bit, was a bit worried as to who he's. So the other guy was with the dark hair. It's like his uncle or the other guy who worked for the agency who came in and hired Joe. I'm not sure whether he was a responsible adult to be taking out a young kid. Well, yeah, I mean, are any of them really responsible adults when they're, you know, using a nine-year-old boy as a secret agent? And it's, I mean, it's a bit creepy because there were two, there were two camps of people who watched Joe 90, those who kind of loved it and, and saw themselves in Joe and those who thought, oh, he's an annoying kid. You know, I don't want to be just like, like an annoying kid. I want to be doing grown-up stuff like they are in Scarlet and Thunderbirds. Which, which camp were you in, if either? Well, I'm not sure about that, but all I know is is that as as a viewer, I did like his. He had some great gadgets that reminded me yep. of his Bond. I think the uh, you know the glasses and something, and then I remember something turning into like a a gun from a pen maybe and things. So he was very neat and tidy, Joe, wasn't he? And, um, yeah, with with a good selection of gadgets. And equally, I did like his theme tune. I liked his music. It was catchy. Yeah. Well, the the music is a major part of all the Anderson series, really, and Barry Gray was responsible for everything from 1959 through to 1975. Wow. Well, so all, the, all the shows you know. Yeah. Um, an amazing composer. And amazing how those tunes, again, stick in the kind of public consciousness and in, in popular culture. I don't know. There, I don't think there are many TV themes where, where most people of any age could, could name them. I think certainly Thunderbirds is one. Yes, yes. I mean, I use Thunderbirds as a talk over track, as a bed, you know, a bed of music on, on Capital for many years. And uh, <laughs> I use the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, as many people have done for, um, yeah. you know, the top 10 at 10 and counting down and the Capital countdown and things. So, yeah, I'm not sure if all the PRS was paid, I do hope so. <laughs> sure it was. But it's amazing that just a, a countdown, a simple countdown can become so iconic. It is because people remember, you know, literally the the zoomed in shot of each uh, of each aircraft as such, yeah. uh, you know, relevant to each number. And I think, you know, it, it's a bit like records in a way, isn't it? You can look back at music in those days and you'll remember where you were when that was number one. You can remember what record label it was and what the B side was. Whereas now, I don't think even a fifteen year old could tell you who's number one or what's in the top ten or how a record is released and if it had a picture cover because no one buys a record they just download something if they want it and probably for free and it, just, it hasn't got the excitement whereas the same with the TV shows these shows will live on in people's memory forever whereas young kids today they don't have a show like that because they've got so much of everything because they can just sit on YouTube and watch not only those shows but every kind of show they want to see or every kind of music they want to hear everything is accessible with a phone and the internet whereas yeah. We were happy with a hoop and a stick. There were two or three. Uh, <laughs> it's true. It's not because, you know, I can look back and say that, you know, people remember Funhouse and come up to me 30 years on. You know, Funhouse is celebrating 30 years um, in literally in, in, in about 25 days time. Yeah. And, um, you know, since it was first aired. And for people to say, you made my childhood, there is no children's television show on now, whether it's on satellite channel or even on the terrestrial, which I don't think there are many shows on terrestrial, who anybody is going to say, you made my childhood to the presenter, not just in 30 years, but probably not even in 30 minutes, because yeah. things just don't last. And no one will ever, ever be able to say a whole generation loved and remembered this and that. And, you know, obviously, uh, you know, the, your dad's shows fall under that banner because now there is too many TV channels, too many radio channels, too much going on on people's mobiles, looking for likes. And it's a completely different world. So it, it will never happen again. So people um, in the future won't be able to talk about um, shows in the same way that they can about your dad's. Yeah, gosh, I hadn't thought of it like that, but... but uh... It's true, it will never happen again. It will, yeah. it will never be the same for a pop star. You know, Ariana Grande is a huge pop star, she's huge. Taylor Swift is huge. But they're, they're never going to be like ABBA. It's never going to have that mass appeal. 
I guess so, yeah, just because of it, we're swamped with content. Exactly. Swamped yeah. with content. You've summed it up in three words that took me a minute. <laughs> yeah, but you went more in-depth. Uh, I just skimmed over. Uh, but less is more. Yeah, oh, oh fine, all right, good. Uh, well, you know, it's. Uh, I hope that there are some iconic entertainment moments and things going on still, but, uh, yeah. You, you may well be right. But anyway, even more reason to celebrate the stuff that is well-remembered, like Anderson stuff and Funhouse. Um, did you move on to the live-action shows, Pat? UFO, Space 1999? Like, or were they slightly the wrong age for you? Straker? Straker? Yeah, yeah, Ed Straker. Yeah. I remember his car was cool and his hair was very cool and he looked cool. <laughs> very modern and space age. So yeah, I, I couldn't tell you an episode storyline, but I just remember it looking futuristic. So for me, yeah. I liked it because it looked like the future. That was what was so clever about your dad. He, he saw what the future would be. And in a way, if you look back at the programs, quite a lot of those things, even for example, the way, you know, I know this is only an audio podcast, but I can see you at the moment on Zoom and you can see me and that's no different to... Uh, to um, you know, the, the the dad in Thunderbirds looking at his sons on the pictures on the wall and, and conversing with them like FaceTime. It's just, it's yeah. it happened, didn't it? Yeah. Well, they they had video calling booths everywhere. Uh, yeah. I mean, um, so, sort of smart watches essentially. Uh, I think um, Samsung for their Galaxy Gear, the, their smart watch, they used a clip from one of the Thunderbirds puppet movies uh, where Alan Alan Tracy appears on a watch somewhere. For an advert a couple of years ago, yeah. So I mean, it's yeah. it's amazing how much futuristic stuff was there, uh, and how yeah how far sighted they were. Sometimes too far sighted. You know, Space nineteen ninety nine, for example. Sadly, we didn't have a moon base by nineteen ninety nine, and still don't. No, uh, I can understand it, but at the end of the day, it would still look like it was feasible for things yeah. that went on, didn't it? It didn't look ridiculous. Uh, and that's why I think kids looked at it and enjoyed it because it looked like, oh, yeah, this is what could happen here. And, you know, then them going around with the, with the, I think it was the one with the alligators and they were on those little floating, or uh, no, down in the tube station or whatever, yeah? And, and that's it. And they were in Both, the, yeah. the floating um, sort of skateboard things that they were sitting on. You know, yeah, the hover, hover bikes or jet bikes yeah. or whatever they used to call them. Yeah, I mean, I quite fancy one of those if you can get them in the shops for Christmas. Oh, <laughs> better than um, better than walking the dog if you can take out the, the jet mobile to walk it instead. Absolutely. I've got some uh, audio here that might uh, interest you. I don't know if you'll be able to hear it or not on here. But the guys who played, um, I don't know if this was the same guy who did it or if it was a different guy who, who did the voices for Brains and Parker. Yeah, David Graham. Yeah, I thought it was him. Yeah, that was it. He did me some eye dents when I was... Oh, really? They came in, and I, I'm sure I've got them here. I don't know if you'll be able to... Hello, Pat, this is Parker here. You should listen to Pet Sharp. <laughs> Fantastic. And I've got one of Brains as well, which I think is, is quite funny. Here we go, this is it, look. Pat Sharp. I, I, I don't think you're going to make it. <laughs> amazing pat yeah. oh, there you go. that's that's absolute proof that you you really are a fan and you're not oh. just uh you know making this up <laughs> yeah, don't make it up at all your dad was an absolute legend with what he did wasn't he and uh you know the, the fact that this lived on as you say commercials i think it was on a halifax commercial recently as well wasn't it yeah absolutely well there's a halifax one and a few years before that there was the brains do the drench commercial the drench water commercial there was a spec savers commercial uh, and you go back even further uh, scott tracy was advertising kit kats in the early 90s i mean it, it it just goes on and on because it's always there and generally speaking it has always come back every sort of five to ten years and and every generation thinks it's been made for them which is I mean, one of the nicest things Look at the Tracy Island thing that blew up, you know, with Blue Peter all those years ago. That was like a complete reincarnation of Thunderbirds because of that, wasn't it? Yeah, well, 90, 91 that was, wasn't it? There was that, that was the, the major, major resurgence. Okay. Um, but that, that was a whole generation of kids that thought it had been made, you know, that year for yeah. them. They didn't realise it was only 30 years old. Yeah. But it, Tracy Island was the number one Christmas toy that Christmas and again in 2000 or 2001. So tw twice in a decade... You know, an old show came back and was the number one Christmas toy. It was amazing. Can't beat it, mate. Yeah, and only then did Dad really kind of appreciate the the long term impact of it all. 
Absolutely. Well, it was well deserved, and uh, it, it was just it, because it was so well made, and uh, mm. it took such a, a, a long time. I read, you know, to do just one scene. Yes. Yeah. That's why it stood the test of time, because people can see that it was um, it was something that you know a computer could probably do in two minutes. And and you know what? I've watched some of the um, the new version that's been out over the last few years, and it didn't really do anything for me. It was kind of like, it was a mix between sort of a cartoon and real people. I know it was really dynamic, but I certainly can't remember any of the storylines. And um, it just all seemed to be just, I don't know, just different. I mean, maybe I'm too old for it now. Well, I don't know. It's, it's, it's difficult argument, isn't it? I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, I declare that we're not connected to it in any way. Um, and, uh, it's very difficult to try and bring back something successfully in a way that still captures the spirit of the original. But I, I, you know, I do think part of its charm and it's the reason it was successful was the tangibility. It was the real, the, the physical, the kind of, you know, you, you could meet these characters. Uh, there was a toys come to life feeling about the vehicles and that kind of thing. You know, if you, like when you, you, you had your dinky SPV or whatever else at home and you were playing with them, there's something that really, connected it physically to what you've seen on the screen whereas cgi stuff doesn't does, just doesn't have the same tangible weight and you know kids now if they watch classic thunderbirds or scarlet they still love it even though it's much slower paced and all that kind of stuff i think because of the the, the quality storytelling the acting the, the voice acting which only was pretty pretty damn good um but also that the amazing physical stuff the effects the explosions the those beautiful dirty down vehicles and all that kind of stuff just yeah, it's a very it's a very different approach. Absolutely, I agree. But my question to you is, what the hell is supermarination? <laughs> Pat, I can't believe you don't know. Um, well, so Dad, Dad was massively embarrassed by working with puppets. He wanted to be making Ben Hur like live action epics, and then he was, you know, in the early days working with sort of you know paper mache puppets with button eyes, that sort of thing. So he was desperate to make them more filmic. Uh, and so they they developed the you know the eyes left to right changing of heads to show different emotion, the 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 flapping lip, to give kind of dialogue sync and all that kind of stuff, and then he wanted to make it sound like uh, you know something that wasn't puppetry. So he took super and marionette and animation and jammed them all together to make up super marionation. And it was his kind of way of putting his stamp on it, but also avoiding the embarrassment of being associated with puppets because he never really liked them. Okay, well, uh, forgive me, what's Marionette? Marionette is, is a strung puppet. Oh, okay. So there you go, super, super marionation. There we are. Right. So, so it, have, you, have you dipped back into those shows over time, Pat, or is, has, has Jerry Anderson stuff you know, reappeared in your life later? I can't imagine you were, uh, uh, you were watching things like Terrorhawks or space precinct or anything like that but have you have you visited it from time to time um terrorhawks i remember them being sort of alien looking creatures i think yes vaguely i don't know space precinct at all um i you know my kids who are 29 27 and 32 they all would have known it uh, yeah but maybe not so much but certainly the boys um, yeah, and they would have watched, I would have put it on for them and they would have enjoyed it. But, you know, I'm not really, I don't really dip into it now at all. But I think if, if it was on somewhere, I'd certainly watch it. And I and I would know what's coming up. So that's what yeah. counts. I remember it, you know, piece for piece, even some of the words, you know, and um, uh, some of the scripts, I could tell you what they're going to say. And I, used to, I quite liked it when um, I think Tintin and Alan would go somewhere and they were on a space station. Maybe it was in the movie, I think, with Lady Penelope, and they were dancing to like Cliff and the Shadows. It was that. That's it. That's the movie, yes. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, they're, they're, and they all, everything looked so great. All the, all, everyone was so smart and the, the drinks were flowing and the band was playing. And it was just, um, it just seemed very glamorous to me. You know, it was, it was really very glamorous for the fact that it was, it was not real. Yeah, but always visually striking, and they always made it look as beautiful as possible. Yeah. And, you know, I can't remember it in black and white, but obviously when it was seen in colour, to me it was it was like anything in colour. It kind of jumped out because you were seeing 
buildings that didn't look like a real building that you'd seen and, and buttons that were flashing with so many lights and things. You just thought, what is this? This is just so futuristic. And that's obviously what it was. That all these things were set in the future. They were all imagined as to how the future would be. And so many of these things, so many of parts of these programs have now come to fruition and are real in our lives. I mean, you know, I could, who, who would have thought, as I say, that we would sit there with FaceTime and Skype and this Zoom thing that we're on now, and people could see each other, talk to each other, crystal clear, without a camera, without the the picture wobbling, and yeah. it doesn't cost anything to do it. It's free, and yet people, some people, you know, it's quite funny these days. They FaceTime somebody by mistake, and they hang up and they phone them back. And they go, "Oh, sorry, I FaceTimed you," and they go, "Oh, that's all right," and they talk on the phone, and they they're not using the free technology as often as they could. Because they just go, oh, it's just a bit weird, isn't it, to FaceTime? So I'll just talk to them on the phone. So they've almost <laughs> gone backwards because yeah. they can use it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure in time, just speaking on the phone will feel weird to people. Oh, um, that's, that's to the people who permanently just use WhatsApp and no one ever talks to each other. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, group WhatsApp. WhatsApps, Pat, I hate those. Don't oh, no, start those. Um, I went to leave a group WhatsApp either. You think, well, if I leave now, they're going to go, oh, he's left. Yeah, exactly. You get in trouble for that. Um, did, just quickly, did you ever have the comics when you were a kid, the TV 21 comics? Yeah, wasn't it Century 21? TV, TV Century 21 comic, yeah. It's funny, though, because I think there's, there was a store in New York right by the World Trade Center which sold quite cheap clothes and obviously... It's not there anymore because they redid the whole area up. Yeah. Uh, and it was called Century 21. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Reminded me, that's why I said Century 21. So if it was called TV Century 21, yeah, I do remember the comics. Uh, but it was ironic that they did open a clothes store called Century 21 by, by literally at the bottom of the World Trade Center. Um, uh, yeah, the comics for me were good. I used to get a few comics back in the day, not just your Beezers and Dandy, but also probably Shoot for Football and... Um, and that one as well. And I remember the Captain Scarlet drawings being quite dramatic and quite, in a way, you would see the same sort of thing as the TV show. You would see like a knife or a gunshot and everything. Yeah, so a lot of those comics were drawn by a, an artist called Mike Noble, who, who just died at the end of last year. But he, he was one of the absolute geniuses of the Scarlet stuff, giving so much kind of dynamic motion. Yeah. Uh, probably brought them to life better than the the puppet show was able to because those puppets were were very difficult to move. They were always on moving walkways and jetpacks and stuff because walking a human proportion puppet makes them look a bit weird. Um, but my yeah, Mike's stuff was was beautiful. Yeah. Um, Pat, I don't want to keep you too long because I know you're a, a very busy man. I'm very grateful for you, for you doing this. If you could <clears throat> reflect on the Jerry Anson shows that you you saw as a kid and loved and and obviously still have. Uh, at least a slightly special place in your heart and memory. Is there any way you can kind of distill what it was about those those shows that made them so appealing to you and, and kind of made such a, a strong impression? I think for me overall, watching any of your dad's shows, the ones that I loved and saw all the time, was the fact that it just took you away to a special place and made you feel like, there was something more exciting out there than just going out on your bike or getting a bit muddy playing football and that there were some incredible things going on either in space or on earth, but either way, a more dramatic version with people dressed in fantastically neat uniforms. I can distinctly remember having a Captain Scarlet uniform and being so proud of the red, uh, the, the, the scarlet sort of uh, thing that he did out there. And just, I mean, it was the neatest thing in my wardrobe. And <laughs> I, I just couldn't believe that I could portray this. It was the same as I felt like with a Batman uniform, to be honest with you. Because if you watch Captain Scarlet or, you know, the guys in Thunderbirds with their uniforms, and, I, and I've got, um, I have got a picture uh, definitely of me, which I'll try and dig out for you, of me in a Thunderbirds uniform with my friends. Oh, you must dig that out, Pat, please. That'd be great. <laughs> There's me and my friends in the Thunderbirds uniform. I know I've got it. Uh, and I'll try and find it somewhere. Um, and, I, and I distinctly remember just feeling that it was taking you away to a special place that didn't, you know, make you think about school or anything at all to do with normal life. You just felt 
like you had a superpower if you wore the uniform. And also, you know, I think Captain Scarlet, you know, I've got I've got three kids, I'm a straight guy and all good, but I think he was devilishly handsome. And I think I wanted to be like Captain Scarlet. He was much more handsome than Captain Blue or any of the others. <laughs> Captain Black wasn't handsome and did look particularly nasty. But Captain yep. Scarlet was just a handsome devil, wasn't he? And, he was. And obviously his voice was by the famous actor, right? Uh, well, it was Francis Matthews doing his very best Cary Grant. Yeah, yeah that's what I thought. Okay, because he didn't really sound like Cary Grant when he yeah. spoke. He was very much like this. Yeah. And um, you know, you know, for, for 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 a kid, you would aspire to be one of these people saving yeah. people's lives, being devilishly handsome, and having a nice uniform to go with it, which was always clean, never went in the wash. <laughs> Yeah, mass- massively aspirational across the board, right? So, sure, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Pat, Pat thank you. Brilliant. Um, Jamie, if, nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah, well, well I've, I've, yeah, uh, small and had lots more hair last time, I think. Um, if people want to find you online, Pat, and see what you're up to, how do they do that? You Twitter or elsewhere? Yeah, I've got a Twitter, which is at Pat Sharp. I've got an Instagram, which is at Mr. Pat Sharp. And my website lists all my... PAs and radio and goings on, and that's just patsharp.co.uk. But don't put an E on it, otherwise it'll be Pate. <laughs> oh. I meant, meant on Sharp. So it's just, <laughs> just Pat Sharp with no E <laughs> on Pat or Sharp. <laughs> Brilliant, Pat. Thank you. And uh, anything particular going on for Funhouse's 30th? Well, there is. We did a couple of years ago, there was a company that looked at doing an live immersive attraction and they tried to get crowdfunding for it and this company through various reasons didn't do it properly and it didn't mm. work they didn't get enough money or they didn't they just asked me to give it their blessing yeah uh, now we've got somebody who is already running um attractions of a similar nature um which which are up and running in this country and uh, they are looking at doing something for the 30th anniversary in the 30th anniversary year with yep. fun so it could be coming uh, an adult version for you to go and play in and then have a drink afterwards and a dance or whatever could be set up for stags and hens very soon which would be great amazing that will make a lot of people very happy i think yeah, so. so watch this space and then obviously after that i'll come back to you and we'll arrange a uh, an adult version of thunderbirds and captain scarlet with real puppets where you get to put strings on your arms and walk in <laughs> do, you, do you know there, there is something not dissimilar under discussion so uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you, well, you know, i mean you know the, obviously when you do the deal you can just sign at the bottom and say look no strings attached but um, <laughs> and on that note, Pat, on that bombshell, absolutely. Thank you ever so much, Pat Sharp. I know he's such a nice chap. Yeah, who'd have he thought? Ju- he'd just come in from walking his doggy as well. Oh, so sweet. anyone with a dog's a friend of mine. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, but yeah, amazingly, one of many many people who went to to visit Dad's lecture tour. Yes, tell us a bit more about that. So when did these happen? Must have been. <clears throat> Early and mid 1990s. Right. He went all over the country. Theatre tour, I suppose. Was yeah, it? sold out yeah. theatres all over the place. Great. And and um, I'm sure, as Nick Briggs said uh, back in whatever podcast he was in, yeah, uh, many many uh, episodes ago, that um, Dad started by saying, "Now, this is not a lecture tour. I'm not lecturing." Right. This is a talk. Right. So he started by saying it wasn't a lecture by lecturing the audience yeah. about it not being a lecture. Uh, <laughs> nice. But anyway, I know lots of celebrity fans went to those because they were so excited to hear, yes. from, you know, hear stories from the horse's mouth. And I, I think Dad did a, a, a shortened version of the lecture tour uh, at Fab Cafe in Manchester, where I operated the um, the VHS machine to play the sequences Did you now? that he was talking about. Yeah. Great. So I'm sure I would have been there illegally because it's an over 18s venue. <laughs> uh, but it was for the opening I think in maybe nineteen ninety five. Right. Possibly earlier. Yeah. I can't remember the Fab Cafe opened. Anyway, uh, yes, the lecture tour did very well and, and um, I've actually got some lovely behind the scenes video uh-huh. of them preparing stuff because they had a great setup of Thunderbird 2 and nice. uh, 1, 3 and Fab 1 which would go on the stage Yeah, it, lovely. Was, it was a great thing great. It was a really lovely thing. well I'm sure so, many of our listeners out there might might well have uh, gone along as well so do let us exactly. know exactly, yeah, if but, you went to the lecture tour we'd mm. love to see any photos, hear yeah. any recollections anything like that because yeah. I'm actually trying to piece together over time a bit of a video because I've got some 
static camera shots of, of the lecture tour, but Lovely. the sound's so bad we yeah. can't really hear what's being said, which is yeah. a great shame. Yeah, anyway. send them to us, podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk. We'd love to see them. Um, now, uh, I've got another couple of tweets just before we move on. Now, Megan has uh, been in touch with us quite a bit over the last week because she went to New Zealand to the Weta, which I'm now saying correctly, workshop. Uh, and <laughs> it's posted... not Weta! It's it, Weta! It? Stop saying Weta! Uh, well, I'm not saying it correctly then. <laughs> it's Weta! Weta, Weta workshop. <laughs> uh, she posted some fantastic pictures anyway. You can see them on Twitter. She's at Gawky, G-A-U-K-Y, 1976. Also, Stephen Watson got in touch to say, great to hear the Richard Gregory tributes on the Jerry Anderson podcast. I love the end music from Terror Horse, which I'd never heard before. So fitting. And following on from um, Endeavour, which we spoke about last time and some of you saw, I know, which featured a sort of a Jerry Anderson-esque puppet sequence uh, as part of its story, uh, Robert Monk said, I don't know if, if anyone else has pointed this out, but one of the puppets on Endeavour looked familiar and the pennies just dropped. It was used in Thunderbirds 1965, the stately home robberies. It was indeed. And that puppet actually has the same hair problem that I've got right now. <laughs> Or the same two ones, both being a baldy, but with the hair sticking out crazily to one side in an uncontrollable manner. Great. So we've come full circle. There we are. How pleasing. <laughs> Lovely. Very good. Uh, well, that's the interview out the way. That's the newsy news 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 out the way. Uh, that's fab facts out the way. So it must mean it's time for, for the favourite bit. I'm so yeah. excited. So this okay. is where Chris Dale, uh, our roving reporter, well, he's not really roving because he does it all from his home, uh, but he sits down in front of a uh, random Jerry Anderson episode every week to give us his thoughts and comments. And I know you all like to join in on Twitter as well and agree with him or not. So uh, it'll be very interesting to see what he's got in store this week. Yeah, well, I know that uh, right now he's in a bit of trouble with a particular blonde wig-wearing commander from the 1960s or 1980s when it's set. Anyway, all will be revealed now <laughs> good luck chris at last entry uh yes decoy what went wrong well it, it just wasn't an episode i was especially familiar with and and that coupled with it not really giving me too much to work with i i'm sorry how long have you been with us what the podcast oh well i started the randomizer in 2018 and it's now 2019 so two years no no not even close Long enough to know how important security is to Shadow. No, no, Commander Straker, please, I, I just... No, controlling be, Moonbase, just... The satellite. Sit down and be quiet. Now, operate the randomizer. You will obey me. Now, when I click my fingers, your other, more agreeable personality will rise to the surface. One, two, three. Who are you? Captain Blue of Spectrum. Ah, jolly good. And what, pray tell, does the printout say I will be watching today? Captain Scarlet. Oh, excellent. Yes, about time we had some more Scarlet. I say, would you like to watch it with me? Alec. Alec. Oh, brainwashing's wearing off, never mind. Oh, uh, just one more question, Captain Blue. Which episode is it? It's Inferno. Thank you very much. Well, here we are, back on far more familiar ground than we were last week. It's the original Captain the Scarlet, Mr. and I think... Sworn I'm just checking my notes here. Yes, this is the first Captain Scarlet well, episode we've had since Pod 12, which means that so far, person. this is... The they longest gap we've had between the first time a show's appeared on the randomizer and its return. Um, although looking at this list, if uh, either Terror Hawks or Four Feather Falls don't appear in the next two or three weeks, then they are going to uh, take the record away from old Captain Scarlet. But anyway, we're not here to talk about them. We're here to talk about. I think this is the final episode of Captain Scarlet made. <laughs> More Thunderbirds music. Uh, I love it when the shows do that. When a show's become so uh, sort of fixed in its own distinctive musical sound and then suddenly they drop in a piece of music from one of the earlier shows, it's great. They've got enough explosive aboard to take care of five rockets, sir. Well, let's just hope they don't miss. Should one of us say that nothing can go wrong, sir? No, no, I think it's a bit, it's a bit too early for that. Uh. Fire lip rockets. Ten seconds from... 
now. This is a very uh, interesting set on this little space probe here with all these automatic uh, controls working. I know much of that is down to the fact that the Mistrons will later take over the ship and uh, be working it by remote, so it kind of makes sense to have those those levers swaying backwards and forwards. But, uh, it still looks a very nice set, and it turned up a couple of times in Joe 90 as well. It's too late. It's going to hit us. And I always felt this meteorite was a slightly unconvincing effect as it as it closes in on the the probe it's sort of wobbling around and then when it hits the probe they something happens which i think they learn from in uh, for ufo and space 1999 the debris on that explosion all fell downwards which doesn't make sense for in space it kind of makes more sense for it to be expanding outwards in all directions but here we go the the original probe is gone as are the crew the mistrons have not reconstructed them because all they need is the plane. We are returning to Earth. Out. So the Mistrons haven't reconstructed the crew of the SKR-4, but they've they've still got their presence there. The the voice is there. I wonder how the Mistrons actually decide who they reconstruct and who they just uh, keep the voices of. Sergeant, with the amount of explosive they've got on board, they're bound to have their hands full. Yes, sir. What, what does he think the uh, does he think the explosives are sort, sort of jumping up and down in the back? Surely there's there's not much chance of an accident happening with the uh, explosives in the back of that thing. But uh, this is Captain Scarlet. Explosions can happen anywhere. It is useless for you to persist in futile attempts to defend yourselves. Come on, it's the last episode of the series. Let us win something, please. To destroy the complex at Nahama. Will Captain Scarlet, Blue, Magenta and Oka report to the control immediately? Better get up there. The Colonel doesn't like to be kept waiting. Well, the last time I was late for a meeting, he hit me. No one will actually be inside the complex. This is what we will do. We'll go in and have a kicking party. The complex can be overlooked from the... Sa Desalinization plant party. Woo. North. Captain Oka, Captain Magenta. Yes, sir. Take the north and south entries. Uh, so Captain Magenta Captain has been Captain assigned Blue. to this operation. This is always a sign that uh, yes, things are going to go well if Captain Magenta's on the case. And here's a... I do like a lot of the visuals in this episode, but I'm not too sure about the desalinization plant itself. It looks very steamy. Oh, possibly. I just noticed there, part of it seems to have been built from uh, part of the Mysteron City in Crater 101. Also, the uh, Scarlet and Blue's SPV parked outside the Aztec Temple appear well, to be part of the really backdrop. Yes. I've not it's noticed that before. It's, it's wonderful years. when, as we're getting these shows upgraded in uh, HD, to see things you never noticed before. Was now here we are in this way. beautiful Aztec temple set. With again more Thunderbirds music. I mean, coming up here is one of my favorite bits of puppetry in this show, as the statue wobbles. Look out, Adam! That shot of Scarlet pushing Blue out of the way looks really real the way Scarlet moves forward and seems to raise up his hands to, to sort of push Blue. Um, there are one or two shots in this episode that, that do look kind of naff, but that one was one of the most impressive bits of puppetry, I think, in this entire series. This will do. Look, there's the complex. Yes, Captain Blue, that's What's the complex. Those? That's what we've come here to Liquid defend. Oxygen. Looks like one explosion could start a chain reaction that would turn the whole valley into a blazing inferno. Are you trying to tempt fate? Oh, you've just read the script. You know what the, epi the title of the episode is. <laughs> I'm still marvelling over this um, interior set of the space probe. There's so many little switches and knobs and levers and such. Again, a, a shot of the Earth from space that looks nothing like the real Earth. This was a problem for Century 21 throughout space-related things. The it's the way they talk. They seem, well, different. Oh, come now. You've played more Mistrons than any other puppet in this show. You know how they talk. You've done enough of it yourself. Oh, here's Captain Black on the scene, peering at the desalinization plant through his binoculars. Now, bearing in mind that uh, Captains Ochre and Magenta were supposedly on guard, one of them has obviously slipped up and um, 
and Black has got through. I think we know from past experience with this show which of the two is more likely to have um, slipped up. Uh, Captain Oka only makes mistakes when he's drunk. Captain Magenta just lives to make mistakes. I mean, Black probably just walked up to him and got waved straight through. I've left a couple of sleeping bags in the temple. He's quite sweet, is Captain Magenta. Yes, I think I will. Is everything all right, Captain Magenta? Everything's fine. Nothing to report. <laughs> you just know that if you were to cut to Captain Magenta at that point, he'd have a bucket stuck on his foot and a beehive stuck on his head or something. But yeah, some really nice uh, atmospheric shots around the temple at night here, around and inside. I, I really like the shot of Blue sleeping and Black is sort of looking at him. But now Black is slowly climbing up the... Um, the statue that, that Blue is sleeping at the base of, and this puppetry is a bit dodgy. Um, okay, that shot of, of Black sort of hanging on by one hand when the bat disturbs him is kind of um, kind of good. But he almost seemed to be sort of floating up as he as he climbed. Which makes me think maybe it might have been a really cool opportunity to just maybe have him float up there just if the, the puppet doesn't look natural climbing but he's not meant to be an ordinary human being anymore give him some sort of ability that um, that makes the scene all the more creepy we searched the whole temple with high-powered flashlights and found nothing I know but I'm high powered sure flashlights Forget it. It what is that like um, six yes, double A's or... right I just hope we don't have to spend another night here Come I'm on, scared on. Captain Scarlet this isn't like Blue. He's, uh, he's usually tougher than this. Anyway, Captain Black has now placed a homing device in the mouth of the uh, the great big statue of the Sun God. Which evidently the space probe is homing in on, even as we speak. Computer readout still A-OK, -okay, sir. There's something strange about these two puppets in the control room on Earth. Firstly, I'm noticing in HD they've got patches on their arms saying World Air Force. Not World Army Air Force, just World Air Force. But secondly, and this is something that uh, a friend of mine, uh, very talented David K. Barnes, mentioned in his uh, series of reviews of Captain Scarlet episodes that some of you may remember once appeared on thevervoid.com. Um, he's commenting about these two guys in the, the Eurotracker headquarters. The fact that they're sitting in this room that has no doors. And his, his question was, did these two guys just sit down one day and have the, uh, the room built around them? Because there's clearly no way in or out of that room. It's a very tiny room with, uh, with no supplies, not even a toilet. Major! Something's transmitting a heavy concentration of radio impulses. They're jamming the SKR-4 re-entry wave band, sir. Did you hear that, Colonel White? It could influence the re-entry and landing position of the SKR-4. Or do I need to repeat it for you again because you're quite slow on the uptake? Spectrum are well known for this. Speed ultimate to the Nahama complex. Speed ultimate, I love that. It's like, is that speed super duper ultra fast? Angel 1, immediate launch. SIG. This is an episode, I have a feeling this episode is one of those where three angels launch and by the time they get to their destination, the, the angels in these cockpits have changed. So Destiny was in Angel 1 and Angels 2 and 3 are Melody and Harmony. And we're going to see who's actually in the cockpits of these interceptors by the time they get to Nahama. They must be planning to destroy the complex with the SKR-4. This is an odd part of the story, and one that I don't understand, because the Mistrons are now in control of the SKR-4 Pro. But Captain Black has placed a homing device in the temple for it to lock onto. But the Mistrons have control of the probe, so... Why can't they just guide it down manually the way they would normally do? We've never seen them need to use any kind of homing device before when they're remotely controlling a vehicle. They didn't need a say, a homing device on the um, Director General of the United Asian Republic. They just controlled the plane and crashed it into him. This, as with many things involving the Mistrons, doesn't really fit with what's gone before. And sometimes you can kind of wave your hands and say, oh, it's, it's a bit vague, but this time it's like, no, this... We've never seen them operate like this before. Yes, I will say that the uh, SKR-4 is looking 
just a teensy bit on the, uh, on the old fanic side uh, as it re-enters the atmosphere and starts glowing pink. Captain Scarlet, that homing device is somewhere right here in this temple. Well, we, we already knew that. Why are you playing the dramatic music? I know it's dramatic for them, but that is, that is quite odd. I don't get why we're supposed to be surprised we've been watching the show up to this point. There isn't enough time left for us to locate it. Destroy the temple. SIG, Captain Scout. And again, this is another part of the story which I don't think on, quite Blue, makes sense because the space probe is well, something like eight minutes away from crashing into the temple at this point. Oh, what use is destroying the homing device going to be? Attack at will. SIG, Destiny. Yes, that was the voice of Rhapsody, who uh, you will recall was not one of the angels who left Cloud Base on this mission. It's a lovely shot of the angels cruising over the top of the temple with the SPV parked, like, just nearby. Um, I don't think they've quite got far enough away to avoid the explosion, but uh, they seem to think they have, and I'm not going to argue with Scarlet and Blue. Oh, and there's Symphony Angel, who also was not one of the angels who left Cloud Base. So somewhere between Cloud Base and the Nahama Temple, Melody and Harmony have just gone missing and they've had to send uh, Rhapsody and Symphony out in their place. And this endless sequence of the angels bombing the temple is another thing that makes no sense. Because if, if you've sort of... Time's running out. If you've sort of resigned to the fact that the probe is probably going to hit the temple, why don't you just fly up and destroy the probe? If the, the Euro space tracker people know where it is, why can't they just relay that information to the angels and have them blow it out of the sky? It kind of... The episode is jumping through hoops to, to make this sort of bad ending happen. 50 seconds to impact. And it doesn't really need to be this way. But instead the angels are just blasting away at this temple to no effect. And I'm not sure what Scarlet and Blue think is going to happen if the transmitter is destroyed. If, if Is the space probe just going to suddenly not be on a collision they course anymore? The transmitter. 30 seconds. And here we go. Well, the statue is the only thing left standing. <laughs> suddenly the whole temple is gone, except for this statue. It must be in there. What happened? One, two, and three. Um, this... The statue of the sun god. There is less than 30 seconds to impact. There are less than 30 seconds to impact. Mr. Bad Grammar, Mr. There Was No Mr. On Activities. Yeah, it's just... I don't get multiple things about this ending. But it does culminate in one of the funniest shots of the entire show, when the angels finally hit this, um, this statue. Who's going to hit it? Who's going to fire the winning shot this week? Is it going to be Symphony? Well, no, no. Here comes Destiny, she's going to have a go. Yep. So she's hit the statue, which then falls forward and explodes. Belches fire out of its backside in actual fact. Okay, whatever. But, and anyway, the space probe hit the remains of the temple, so all of that was pointless. Hey, you know what you guys should have done? You should have flown up and destroyed the space probe before it hit the temple. Because now... It started a landslide. Yeah. The rock fall hits one of those tanks. Mm, didn't think about this, did we? Oh, and there goes the very thing that um, Spectrum was sent to protect. Spectrum have indeed failed this time. A very rare victory for the Mistrons. Unfortunately, by this point in the series, it always seemed to be that the Mistrons would succeed when when no lives were in, in danger. We know that this complex was evacuated. Uh, so, aside from the whole desalinization project being set back... It's an inferno. The complex must be completely destroyed. It's not really much of a downer we ending for Spectrum, even no though they have lost. There. Well, the Mysterons have won this round, but the fight isn't over yet. Also with this ending, I always like to imagine that um, Oka or Magenta are just looking at it through binoculars and thinking, oh, come on, really? 
really. We couldn't even stop them this time. Anyway, that was Inferno. Um, and I do... Yeah, I think I do still really like this one. Um, again, the whole... Using a homing device to crash the space probe lets destroy the, the, the building that the homing device is in rather than the, the space probe itself. As if that's going to make any difference. Is kind of a bit muddled. Having said that, some really nice visuals, particularly in the uh, Aztec Temple. And as, as for this being the final episode of the show that was made, I don't, I don't see why. I don't see why this would have been held back. Sometimes they would hold back episodes, shoot them last so they could trash the sets and things. If this was made after Attack on Cloudbase, they didn't trash anything. Anyway, second outing for Captain Scarlet on the randomizer. Another reasonably good one. Oh, a nice bit of Scarlet, but yeah. it's a while since we've seen that, as Chris yeah. said. Always welcome, um, though, isn't it? Now, isn't it funny, things like continuity issues, like that, the angels, where some angels leave cloud-based and other angels arrive <laughs> yes. at the other end, where <laughs> it wasn't picked up at, at script editing stage. Yeah. And I suppose even when they got through it, even if anybody spotted it, they probably thought, oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, you know, or it's too late. They're going to watch this once. Or, well, too late. I mean, it was the last one that was shot, so yeah. yes. It, yeah, yeah probably was too late yeah so, but I, I wonder if they knew at the time yes um but yeah very interesting oh. and also uh and also um the the fact that that statue comes down yeah. uh and blows <laughs> yeah, up lovely. as if it was made made out of tnt that's i mean that, right. that is well that's a classic hallmark of anderson isn't what it anyway? the is going on there yeah. it's, it, really, it really is yes what would jerry anderson be without the without the explosions we know that yeah yeah well in fact uh, Space Precinct, Richard, as you know, mm. I think. Yes. Dad, Dad had a bit of an argument with Steve Begg in the early days of Space Precinct. Oh yes. And said, Steve, <clears throat> why does everything blow up, uh, looking like it's made out of forty thousand <laughs> tons of TNT? I mean, it's just it's not realistic. <laughs> and I think Steve was a bit flabbergasted. It's said, not realistic. Uh, I love Jerry, that. Jerry, have you watched any of your own, your own shows? <laughs> yeah. These are hallmarks of your stuff. Anyway, there That's you go. Great. So, yeah, talking of continuity errors, actually, and Space Precinct. Uh, there's quite a famous one in an episode called Deadline, I think, which was a John oh, yeah. Glenn directed. Yeah, uh, there's a character called Wirt who dies in an episode, only to be seen uh, earlier in the episode, only to be seen in the back of the uh, of a limousine as it flies through the uh, the skies of Demeter, oh. alive and well, it seems. Oh, yeah, whoops. I, I know. didn't know that. Uh, uh, there's two things about that that I always think. Firstly, uh, imagine the sort of pit in the stomach feeling when they realise they must mm. have spotted it at some point and thought, oh god, no. <laughs> Because yep. can't go back now, can't reshoot it, it's got to go in. Um, but secondly, I think continuity errors are really quite interesting. And I think people love them because it makes them feel rather clever when they spot them, don't they? Gives them one yeah. over on the uh, programme makers. Aha! I've, I've spotted something. I think they yeah. like that. It does, but I wonder if an imperfection like that actually gives it a charm well, in the same way that, yeah. you know, the imperfections of classic Doctor Who or yeah. the imperfections of Thunderbirds, you know, the kind of bits of... Uh, set movement and set wobble yeah. all that kind of thing just give it a kind of handmade human crafted feel yes. because obviously it's know. just made by lots of people all trying to do their best but they yeah. are just people and you know yeah. mistakes and are made huge numbers of people trying to coordinate absolutely. something absolutely it's amazing yeah. that any of these things get made at all yes. to be honest yes so, indeed that is absolutely yes. true here's to more continuity errors <laughs> if you've great. spotted a continuity error in a Jerry Anderson production <laughs> then do drop us a line podcast at jerryanderson.co.uk yeah yeah I'm really looking forward to my lunch in Marlow as soon as we finish this set. oh there's a continuity error oh, oh you see what I did oh yeah I see what you did cool. there yeah for those that are really listening uh, great, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for that, Chris. So don't forget to join in for Pod 39 next week when uh, Chris will be off on another adventure. Also, please, please subscribe to we, uh, to us on whichever platform you're listening to us on and uh, rate us and review us and share us. That would be lovely. Get in touch. Podcast at jerryanson.co.uk and hashtag us on Twitter. Yeah, Jerry Anderson podcast. All those things. Thank you, Richard, for doing that there so succinctly. Um, <laughs> and Richard, we are on our way to, you know, at the half century. We are, aren't we? Uh, so if you, dear listeners, have got any ideas of how we might celebrate our 50th podcast, which yeah. will be coming up in, well, 11 podcast time yeah. after the next one. Mm. We <laughs> should have a tweet-up, shouldn't time. we? We should have a meet-up. We should have a podcast meet-up. Yeah, we could have a podcast meet-up, couldn't we? Get some people along. Yeah, where would we do it, though? It'd have to be fairly central, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's a difficulty. Anyway, email us in with your suggestions of what you think we could do. Yeah. Um, it'd be quite fun, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Yeah. Anyway... Have a think until next week. I'm glad I'm not organising it. <laughs> oh, yeah. yes. That'll be fun, won't it? Well, at least we've got 12 weeks to do it. Yeah. Uh, 
so that's it, Richard, isn't it? We're yeah, done. I think that's about it, yes. My stomach's rumbling, so it's time to go. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Have a lovely day, Richard. And Have a you. lovely day, listeners. Yeah. And we'll see you next week. Yes. Till then, goodbye. Bye. Stage one complete. Let's go. Seamless, wasn't it? Throughout, yes. as always. Yeah, that's great. That was a nice one. <laughs> We've got a particular delay today, which is making it slightly difficult. Oh, I didn't notice. <laughs> yeah, it's it's like an extra half second ah, yeah, to, to yeah. normal. I think because I'm uploading stuff, actually, it's my own fault. Yeah, actually, um, what it is, Jamie, is that I'm deliberately waiting half a second till I respond to whatever you say, just to mess your head up. Oh, are you? Yeah. That's really annoying. I said, hello? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Now go on, you're talking over me then. <laughs> We're going to do that sketch now where you ask, ask, answer the previous question. <laughs> yeah, you could do that. <laughs> yeah. Talk about the previous podcast. Oh, uh, no. No, let's not do that. No. Uh, anyway, so have a lovely lunch. Yes, I will. I'll try. Cafe Rouge. Yes, thank you very much. Are you going to try and spend £24.98? Exactly. Pounds? Not a penny more. <laughs> 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 you know me so well. You tight git. <laughs> Anyway, and have a lovely time. Send my regards to Charlotte. Yes, I will. Thank you very much, Jamie. And, uh, yeah. See you I, next I'll week. S- well, I, I'll see, I'll, I will see you on Monday. Yeah, you will indeed, yeah. Yeah, yeah. see you then.